I'm going to call upon the chaplain sister Dottie Almany to lead hymn and prayer time. All right, we're going to start with the hymn part. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Let's work it off. Let's all stand and sing together. Goes like this. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Let's do that again. Our strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Let's wait. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. Do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Let's sing it again. Here we go. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. job, everybody. Our next prayer is going to come from Tracy D. Pasquale, who is Director of Lutheran Advocacy Ministry in Pennsylvania. Let us pray. You bid us set the table, Lord, and invite all to come. Inspire us by your spirit to set a table where all are welcome and nourished. Discover mercy, find justice, and share in the riches of your grace. May our table be a place where we listen to one another, where divisions are healed, and where we treasure the power of your grace. 
We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. During our time together, we invite you to reflect on what it is you love about God's good creation and how you are called by your baptism to be part of God's mission in the world. Please visit the tables at the back of this space to fill out your prayer ribbon that will be added to our tree and your commitment to making a faithful response to climate change near um, in the, uh, around the mural of our common home. So please participate in that. Um, I have a point of personal privilege with the Reverend Sean Berkebile. Do we know where he is? Oh, that's why I couldn't see you. You were right in front of me. <laughs> Microphone number one. So I just have a point of privilege. I'm Pastor Sean Berkebile from St. John's Lutheran Church in Abbottstown, and I also serve on the board of New Hope Ministries uh, that serves a lot of our communities across the Lower Susquehanna Synod. Um, I got a phone call not too long ago from uh, Mickey Balker, who is the president of Plainville Farms, and I learned something very interesting about today. Today, Friday, June 7th, is the National Turkey Federation's annual Turkey Day of Service. Now you all know. <laughs> Plainville Farms is a proud member of the National Turkey Federation and also serves the New Oxford community. They are one of the large turkey plants in New Oxford that serves a lot of Adams County. On behalf of Plainville Farms, I'm pleased to announce the donation of over 4,000 pounds of whole turkeys to, do, to New Hope Ministries, which were delivered today at 2.30. Um, and they're proud to support their community as well as be a uh, valuable organization in our uh, Lower Susquehanna Synod. So I wanted to bring that as God's abundance being given to um, our local pantries, which these turkeys were dropped off at 2 o'clock um, at Hanover Center for New Hope Ministries. And it's a pretty awesome donation. So thank you, Plainville Farms, and thanks to the community. I'm sure there's a turkey joke in there somewhere, but I just can't pull it together right now. I would like to introduce our biblical storyteller, Dr. Tracy Radicevic. Tracy is an internationally acclaimed storyteller, educator, and retreat facilitator. Since 1991, she's traveled all over the United States as well to several foreign countries, bringing her special brand of humor, insight, and faith to audiences of all ages throughout the, through the power of narrative. Dr. Radicevic is the Dean of Academy for Biblical Storytelling and adjunct professor at two seminaries. She's also helping us with our Certificate for Missional Preaching, which will highlight the Bishop's Convocation this year. Um, and so we are delighted to have her with us. There you are. <laughs> Always a worry for me. <laughs> it's all yours. Thank you. <laughs> the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness of Judea preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and, and all the people from Jerusalem were coming out to John in order to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. And they came confessing their sins. Now John wore clothing made of camel hair he wore a leather belt around his waist, and for food, he ate locusts and mm, wild honey. And he preached, saying, the one who is more powerful than I is coming. 
I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. Yes, I have baptized you with water, but he, well, he will, he, he will baptize you with, with the Holy Spirit. Well, just then, Jesus himself came from Nazareth and Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And just as he was coming up out of that water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit of God descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven saying, You're my boy. And I love you. I am so pleased with you. And immediately the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. And he remained in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Well, once John was arrested, Jesus returned to Galilee, preaching the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come Hmm. has come near. Repent and believe in this good news. Well, as he passed along, he passed by the Sea of Galilee. And he saw Andrew and his brother Simon casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. So Jesus called to them, saying, <clears throat> Follow me! And, uh, and I'll teach you how to fish for people. <laughs> and immediately they left their nets and followed him. <laughs> so going on a little farther, <laughs> he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. Now they were sitting in their boat, mending their nets. And immediately, Jesus called to them. And they left their father Zebedee right there in the boat with the hired hands, and they followed him. <sighs> well, they came to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue in order to teach, and everyone was amazed at his teachings. They said, well, he teaches with authority, and yet not like one of the scribes. <laughs> well, just then. There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit who cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God! The Holy One of God! But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Silence! Come out of him! And the unclean spirit convulsing the man and crying and a loud voice came out, leaving everyone utterly amazed, saying, what is this? A, a, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits. Obey him. And immediately, 
his fame began to spread throughout the entire region of the Galilee. Well, once Jesus left the synagogue, he entered the home of Simon and his brother Andrew, along with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed, ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. So Jesus went and took her by the hand, and he lifted her up. The fever left her, and she was then able to serve them. Well, that night, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons. <laughs> In fact, the whole city was gathered there at the door. And he cured many people. And he cast out many demons. But he would not allow the demons to speak. Because they're the ones who knew who he was. Well, very early in the morning, while it was still dark... Jesus got up, and he went out to a lonely place by himself. And there, he prayed. Well, Simon and the others hunted for him. And at last, when they found him, they said to him, Come on, everyone's looking for you. But Jesus said to them, hmm, No, let's... Let's go into the neighboring towns so, so that I might proclaim the message there. I mean, after all, that's what I came out to do. So they went throughout the entire region of the Galilee, proclaiming the message in all of their synagogues and casting out many demons. And a leper came to him begging him, and falling on the ground before him, said, if, if, if you choose, you could make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, said, I do choose. And he reached out and he touched the leper. And he said to him, be made clean. Immediately, he was made clean. Now, after giving him strict orders, Jesus immediately sent him away, saying, now, go to the priest, show yourself to him, and make an offering for your cleansing, like Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But the leper, he went out, and he began to proclaim freely, <laughs> telling everyone all that Jesus had done, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter any of the towns, but was confined to the countryside. And yet, people still came to him <laughs> from every quarter. This is the word of the Lord. Be Tracy, thank you. And uh, I have something for you if you want to make your way up here. No. <laughs> we just wanted to give you a gift to remember your time here at the Lower Susquehanna Synod and a gift that you have been to us. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. We are now at the time um, for the elections, and so I would call on Sister Joy Hovis, deacon serving St. Luke Lutheran Church in New Bridgefield and the chair of the elections committee, and she will give instructions on balloting and lead the assembly through the voting process. 
you will find the biographies of officer nominees on pages 111 to 113, and the bios of city council and discipline committee nominees are on page 602 to 615. Thank you, Bishop Dunlap. It's now time for our first ballot for Senate Secretary, Senate Council, and Discipline Committee. As the Bishop has told us, um, the biographies for um, Senate Secretary nominees can be found on page 111 to 113 of your bulletin reports. And as he's already stated, the Senate Council and Discipline Committee nominees are on page 602 to 615. Before each election, the name of the nominees will be presented on the screen. And on your Quizdom device vote for letter or number corresponding with the name of the person that you would like to vote for. For each election, a majority of 50% plus one is required. May we proceed? The ballot for Senate Secretary. The nominees are Joyce E. Frem, Nancy J. Martin, the Reverend Beth A. Slegel. When directed by the bishop, please vote for one. So you will need your device and you need to turn it on. That would be helpful. And we'll just kind of make sure we're all powered up. I am currently inactive. Did I do something bad? <laughs> Menu? It's searching. Searching. No net. I'm, I'm up here with no net. <laughs> I'm talking about here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of doing my act with no net here. Maybe you dropped your net. No? <laughs> How are the rest of you doing, even though I'm a problem child at this moment? We good? We got devices? We got them on? You? Okay. Could we have the nominees' names and numbers? There they are. So we're voting for Synod Secretary, and you have three choices, A, B, or C. You may begin voting. Oh, stop. I was just a test. Wanted to make sure you were paying attention. Sister Dottie, will you lead us in prayer? <laughs> Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we come before you today in this important election. It is, a holy, it is holy work to be part of this Lower Susquehanna Synod as a secretary. Help us to discern the best candidate and be with all of us as we continue to follow the Spirit. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Now you may vote. How are we doing? Anybody having trouble? Okay, I'm going to declare that the voting is closed. And at this moment, we do a little bit of um, magic in the back to make sure that everything is working. And mm -hmm. 
This is where I tap dance. <laughs> You've seen me dance before. That's not ever happening again. <laughs> yeah, it's available on Facebook. <laughs> Yes. The count is the number of ballots cast, 527, needed to elect 265. And the results? Joyce Ephraim, 137 votes. Nancy J. Martin, 168 votes and the Reverend Beth A. Schlegel, 222 votes. So we do not have an election. I can keep... Okay, so we will do a second ballot on the position of Synod Secretary. And the remaining two candidates are Nancy J. Martin and the Reverend Beth A. Schlegel. And we will do this, um, and you have in front of you the choices of B and C. So please make a choice of B or C. Anybody having trouble voting? We got a problem over here? Yep, we're good. All right, then I declare that the voting is closed for Synod Secretary. We'll wait a moment while they get that pulled together for you. You know, in honor of D-Day, there was a pastor standing in the back of the church um, he had his acolyte with him. There's a little plaque on the wall, you know, for those who died in the service. And the young man said to the pastor, tell me, you know, about this. And he said, well, that plaque is to honor those who have died in the service. And he said, the early or the late? <laughs> <laughs> Any news? <laughs> We're waiting. All right. I'm going to have to work on more material. <laughs> okay, some news. It's got, you got it? Bishop. Did they just put it on here? Okay. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. For Synod Secretary, number of ballots cast, 527, needed to elect, 530. No. <laughs> we, we have to go out I, up to the highways and byways just... and drag in three people. I was just making sure they were awake. <laughs> okay. I have that Nancy has 245, and the Reverend Beth Slagle has 222. That was last time? No. This is the number cast. The phone's wrong. So it's 285, 245. We're working.
working on it. We'll get it. This is what I have. Okay. Nancy. Nancy 245 and Beth 285. Okay, did you want to announce that? So I don't screw it up again? Rob, you got the same numbers as I got? Okay, the number cast 530. Yes. Need it to no, elect? 266. Okay, and then you want to say the rest? Nope, it's your thing. I'm okay. just making sure we have the same I answer. Think we okay. Oh, nuts. I just lost it. Okay. I think we have it for sure. The number of ballots cast is for. Oh, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> we need a different system. Okay, we're third time's the charm. Number of ballots cast 530. Needed to elect 266. Nancy J. Martin, 245. And the Reverend Beth A. Slegel. 285. All right. I declare that the Reverend Beth A. Schlegel is elected Secretary of the Lower Susquehanna Synod. We are going to move on to Synod Council Clergy. The ballot is for Synod Council Clergy. The nominees are the Reverend Kathleen A. Klug, the Reverend Denise B. Horn, the Reverend Gretchen S. Erian, the Reverend Benjamin S. Erskis, the Reverend Jack M. Horner. When directed by the bishop, please vote for two. Pastor Almany? Deacon, sorry. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, help God our decisions. Be with us as we think about and resonate on these names that are put before us. Help us make good decisions and to be with those whether they win or lose because we are all children of God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Everyone's got their machine and ready to go. You would want to pick two choices and then hit the send key. How are we doing? Hmm? Okay. We got it covered. All right. We got it covered. Anybody, where are we having? We got a group waving at me up here. Hello? Good to see you. Not ready yet. Okay. How about now? We're good? No, not everybody? All right. I'm getting that thumbs up from the page, so I think we're good. All right, we'll close that ballot, and we'll wait for the results. Would you like some words of wisdom? Yeah. 
There is a very fine line between a long, drawn-out sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> Later tonight, you'll find out. <laughs> no. <laughs> picture of someone's thumb though. <laughs> Joe, you got it? I do. I think I do anyway. All right. Okay. Uh, uh. The number of ballots cast, 579, needed to elect 261. Would you like me to read the results? Yes, please. All right. The Reverend Kathleen Klug, 137, the Reverend Denise B. Horn, 175. The Reverend Gretchen Aaron, Erian, sorry, 251. The Reverend Benjamin S. Erskus. Thank you. 219. And the Reverend Jack M. Warner, 228. So based on those numbers, no one was elected to Synod Council, so we will vote again. Tom? Okay. Okay, we'll eliminate um, option A, Kathleen Cool, and we will vote again with the four remaining candidates, B, C, and E. So it's the same deal. You pick two and hit the send. We're all voted? Yeah. No, nope, I got a hand waving in the back. <laughs> Are we good? All right. We close that ballot, and the team will check the numbers. So what's the similarity between Attila the Hun and John the Baptist? They have the same middle name. Ah. <laughs> Somebody woke up out there. <laughs> I got it. 
You get it, Joy? Okay, I'm going to steal your thunder. How's that? That's quite all right. All right. There were 533 ballots cast. <laughs> Am I still alive? Okay, sorry. Sorry. 533 ballots cast. 268 were needed to elect. The Reverend Denise Bourne, 196. The Reverend Gretchen Erian, 331. The Reverend Benjamin S. Erskis, 246. And the Reverend Jack Horner, 266. That means that I declare that the Reverend Gretchen Erian is elected. And we will remove the Reverend Denise Horn, and we will then vote between the Reverend Benjamin Erskis and the Reverend Jack Horner for Synod Council. Oh, wow, things happened there. Okay. So you are now down to choice D and E, and you are to pick one, no more two. How are we doing? Buttons all pushed, arrows checked, life's good. I, I closed that ballot for Synod Council. In a moment, we'll have the result. Bless you. You got it? Yes, sir. Okay. Ballots cast, 525. Needed to elect, 264. The Reverend Benjamin S. Exor Exor oh, help me out, thank you. 248. And the Reverend Jack M. Horner, 281. I declare that the Reverend Jack M. Horner is elected to Synod Council. At this point, I'm going to have to call the order of the day because we have to stay on schedule with the other pieces and we will come back to the election committee at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. Turn off the devices. Okay. I'm going to ask you to turn off your devices, you know, save a little power here. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to turn the chair over to Deacon Rothmeyer, and she will report with us on the um, second ballot for Bishop. The mic on. I will call on Joe Stepanski, the chair of the Bishop Election Committee, for the results of the second ballot for Bishop of the Lower Susquehanna Synod. Thank you. On ballot two in the election of Bishop, the results are as follows Total number of ballots cast, 571. Number of illegal ballots, zero. You listen. Total number of legal ballots, 571. 
Number of ballots required for election, 429. The Reverend James S. Dunlop, 338. The Reverend Stephen R. Hare, her, uh, her, I apologize. The Reverend Stephen R. Hare, 152. The Reverend Lisa M. Lieber, 20. The Reverend Joel S. Falkamer, 13. The Reverend Brian A. McClinton, 12. The Reverend Timothy A. Menser, 11. The Reverend Dana Block Hansen, 10. The Reverend Matthew B. Best, 8. The Reverend Brian A. Beery, 3. The Reverend Beth A. Schlegel, 2. The Reverend Joseph A. Danella II, 1. The Reverend Benjamin S. Erskus, 1. The Reverend Larry G. Hummer, 0. The Reverend Robert G. Moore, 0. Based upon the report of the Elections Committee, there is no election. The following persons will appear on the third ballot. The Reverend James S. Dunlop, the Reverend Stephen R. Herr, the Reverend Lisa M. Lieber, the Reverend Joel Fulkemer, the Reverend Brian A. McClintock, the Reverend Timothy A. Menser, and the Reverend Dana Block Hansen. The bios of these seven individuals are available on the Lower Susquehanna Synod website, the assembly page. A limited number of copies of the bios are available at the pages table. The election process for Bishop continues this afternoon following the mission focus. Remember that this time begins with an introduction and a five minute presentation from each of the nominees. I now request that the seven nominees who will appear on the third ballot join Joe Stepanski now on, over in that corner for instructions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I turn the chair to Vice President Brinkman. I'd like to introduce to you a mission focus related to our missional priority of encouraging cooperation. We have a video today about the story of the merger of Zion Lutheran Church Penbrook into the Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd Paxtang Harrisburg. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. My name is Greg Borzak. I'm the present president of the Good Shepherd Church Council. As we came together with Zion, um, there was a lot of talk about their grieving uh, that they would experience, along with the, the, the things that Good Shepherd was going to lose because of joining together. The congregation, there was some fear in how this would take place. The main thing that happened was the coming together of the two pastors, Pastor Baker and Pastor Carnes. They became very close friends. They bonded. And it just kind of became a top-down thing through, and it ran through the vein of all of us. And it was an inspiration, and God was at work, and we all kind of came together, and now there's a spirit of cooperation. We're really working through it. I'm Susan Master, the former president of Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church of Pembroke, Harrisburg. And the reason why that Zion has um, merged with Good Shepherd is we became an older congregation without multiple youth and with that we were also taking monies from our endowment fund for the general accounting. As far as the membership of Zion, the majority of the uh, individuals, the folks have transferred their membership. So yes, it was a grieving process for for us to merge. I won't say close the doors because we didn't. We merged, and it was mostly due to the lack of finances and dwindling our endowment fund that we had at Zion. Yeah, I'm Bernal Christ, and I was a member of Zion Lutheran Church for over 50 years. So. We started to uh, lose our youth, 
and you lose our people, lose our money. And so the merger came up. We decided that this would be a good place. And personally, um, I, for me, the people were very uh, welcoming. Uh, they're, they're real nice people. It's a good congregation. And it wasn't too hard to blend in. Um, I think we are adapting to uh, this particular Lutheran church. I'm Dixie McCauley. I'm from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, and I was council president the last two years leading up to the merger with Zion. Um, the process has been, you know, probably a five year process. You know, the b bishop put out the word that he's trying to find ways for congregations to work together. And with Zion's financial situation, um, they chose us as the, as the church to merge with. It involved a lot of meetings, um, but it involved meetings that required a lot of listening. Listening to one another, listening to our needs, our concerns, uh, just being very open and honest. Um, and it was sharing with the congregation as much information as we were permitted to share at various times. I have to say that, you know, we were constantly trying to discern God's will in all this, looking to his Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us in the direction that he would have us go. It was definitely a journey. Um, and I, I will say that, you know, a lot of us here at Good Shepherd um, tried very hard to empathize with the folks from Zion because we recognized that this was gonna be a grieving process for them. You know, they were leaving a building and it's not just a building. You know, memories were made there. We had to be very sympathetic or empathetic to their concerns and needs. There were programs that they definitely wanted to carry on, Meals on Wheels, the Women's Workshop. Those were very important to those, to those people to continue those ministries. And it was important to us to include those ministries as, as part of the merger. Hi, I'm Susie Christ, a former member of Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church in Pembroke. We were very active with a Meals on Wheels program that went out of Pembroke. And one of the first joys of that was when we talked merger, there was going to be a place in Good Shepherd for that to continue. I'm Sue Bricker, and um, I was involved from the beginning. I'm on council, and um, like anything else, any new experience, it can be a little bit scary, a little bit challenging, but wow, um, I've been more than impressed, and I think of it as a true miracle for our church, and with hopefully Zion feels the same way. They just brought so many things to us, um, the sewing group, things we didn't have, the Welka, uh, the prayer chain, but most importantly, I think it's the mix of the original Good Shepherd people and what we call the newer members, the Zion uh, people who merged with us, and it's one big family in Christ, and I just think that's um, an amazing feat. I'd like to ask Pastor Kathy Baker, Pastor Pam Carnes, and the lay members of Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd to stand and be recognized. Where are they? Up there. This encouraging cooperation thing is not something that comes quick or easy. They talked about we spent five years figuring it out. So when we think that we're gonna fix everything in a short period of time, it's not gonna happen like that. But we are excited every time that somebody shows a new way to do something. Um, in, oh, this is, goes way back. When we did the um, year of reformation in 2011, and we listened to a bunch of people, I distinctly remember sitting at a meeting where people came to talk to us, we were doing <coughs> listening posts, and these two congregations said, you know, we do all this great stuff. It's really good. We do this together, and we do this together, and we do this together. And then one of them said, and they should come to our church. And so it's kind of like this, we have to come to a new way of thinking. We don't get to say, 
We really get along well. Shut yours down. We're here. I believe they should be shortly ready. I'll let you know. She'll probably go over the rules again, but when they come in, um, each speech is five minutes. There is no applause allowed until all have finished speaking at the end. So we are going to go one after another. The parliamentarian will time folks. He'll give them a warning when they have 30 seconds left, and then Deacon Rothmeyer We'll call time when it is finished. Are there any questions about how this will proceed? I just want to let you know also that when the speeches are all finished and we have shown our appreciation, our rules of procedure require 10 minutes for um, voting members to engage in conversation together. So there will be a break at that time. Subsequent to when the rules were determined, we decided to hold everything else for the bishop's election till tomorrow morning because that actually gives you all of dinner time and um, whatever evening time you have together to discuss and discern together as a, a synod related to our bishop election. Rob Blizzard. So when I was on my way here this morning, um, I was my husband's a voting member, and I said, you know, the bishop gets his jokes ready, and I don't do anything, because I'm not really much of a joke person. So I texted my daughter, and I said, I need some jokes. Tell me a joke Isaac would tell. She said, you seriously want a joke a six-year-old tells? <laughs> so here's what the six-year-old had to offer. Where does a T-Rex buy his ketchup? At the dino store. <laughs> Gotta think like a six-year-old. Rob? Oh boy, that, what a tough act to follow, I'll tell you. I, got it. I, actually have, I actually have another one. How does a cow stay up to date? He reads the newspaper. Oh. Well, you know, we, um, we're ecumenical, so we need to learn more about each other's traditions. So uh, how many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? It takes two. One to call the electrician and one to pour the sherry. Oh. <laughs> so how many Lutherans does it take to change a light bulb? Change? My grandfather gave that light bulb. Okay. Okay. Don't tell anyone outside of this that I'm this assembly. How many LCMS people does it take to change a light bulb? Oh no, we'll just sit here in the dark. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. So um, Sunday school is a big part of our tradition. And uh, one day the uh, Sunday school teacher said, I want everybody to draw a picture of Jesus. And uh, so one kid drew uh, a picture of, uh, uh, of his favorite Bible story. And he said, because an airplane in the sky. He said, what, what kind of picture of this is Jesus? He goes, well, this is the flight to Egypt. <laughs> here's Mary, and here's Joseph, and here's the little baby Jesus. And there's Pontius the pilot. He's driving. <laughs> well, I, think, I think we may be uh, ready to rock and roll. 
Thank you very much. Would that be? I think that's more a matter of, I think we may be rescued. <laughs> I now return the chair to Deacon Rothmeyer. I believe Lucinda shared some of the instructions, but I will repeat some of them so that we're all clear on the process as it goes forward. Um, first of all, I think she did indicate that we ask that during this time, we are respectful and we will have an opportunity to show our appreciation for everyone at the end. But if we would hold applause until the very end when all seven have spoken and then you can show your gratitude to the entire group. I will read the names of the seven nominees in the order in which they will speak and ask them to stand so that we can once identify name with the person. The bios have indeed been posted online at our live at assembly webpage. And as we indicated before, a limited number of hard copies are available at the pages table. So I will introduce all seven and then we will begin with the first person who will be speaking to us. But the seven in order of, the, of their speaking will be, first, the Reverend Lisa M. Lieber. Second, the Reverend James S. Dunlop. Third, the Reverend Timothy A. Menzer. Fourth, the Reverend Brian A. McClinton. Fifth, the Reverend Dana Block Hansen. Sixth, the Reverend Stephen R. Herr. And seventh, the Reverend Joel Fokamore. We begin with the Reverend Lisa Lieber. Good afternoon. I am Lisa Lieber, and I am honored to be standing before you this afternoon as a nominee for bishop. It's been several weeks since I received an email from our Synod Secretary, Tom McKee, informing me that my name had been lifted up for this office by one of our Synod's conferences. Since then, I have been praying, thinking, reflecting, pondering, evaluating, contemplating, discerning, and all those other things one does in such a situation. I even made this handy manila folder to collect and organize my thoughts and ideas and the various documents I printed off our Synod and ELCA websites. There is always a lot of hope involved in a process such as a bishop's election. You are all here because you care about Christ's church. Whether you are a minister of word and service or a minister of word and sacrament or a lay person, you care about the good news that has been entrusted to us by God. You care that people hear the story of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. You care that we feed the hungry as we are fed by Christ. And so, at such a time as this, we hope, we hope to call a bishop who will help make all of that happen, who will have brilliant insights into emerging trends in church attendance and seminary enrollment, who will have the answers for struggling congregations, who will develop new models for cooperation and figure out how to increase mission support. We heard last evening from our ELCA representative, Deacon Rothmeyer, and Vice President Bringman and Dean Roscoe, the expectations laid on synod bishops. It is quite a burden. I don't know all of my fellow nominees for Bishop Well, but I suspect that any one of the seven of us elected to serve in that office would work hard do our best and make mistakes, some small ones and some biggies. We'd each excel in different areas, each disappoint you in different ways. But the ministry of this synod, 
all of us together, our congregations and camps, our social ministry organizations and campus ministries, our advocacy ministry and seminary, that ministry is not about the bishop and his or her successes and failures as a leader. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the one we follow. And so we have hope. Again, it is an honor to be before you as a nominee for bishop. I haven't spent this time reviewing my resume with you or sharing concrete details about how, if elected, I would do bishop. Five minutes is simply inadequate for that. Instead, I wanted to give you a sense of how I view the office. Thank you for listening. Blessings on your ministries. And may God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us as we make our way through this election process. Thank you, Pastor Lieber. Our next speaker, the Reverend James S. Dunlop. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I've learned a great deal in the last six years. Six years ago, I spoke about how in Littlestown there was a very popular McDonald's restaurant. Suddenly they closed it and bulldozed it, and they built a brand new McDonald's in the exact same place that was better to meet the needs of their customers in a changing environment. And I asked some questions like, when was the last time we bulldozed something in the church? Maybe a building, or more importantly, are we willing to change to meet the changing needs that we see in the church? So, it's been six years, have we made everything new? No, it takes time. I've been learning patience as a spiritual gift. Not just, that's not an easy one for me. We focused on how to feed the hungers we see around us. We focused on developing leaders, caring for leaders, wellness retreats, giving our leaders a time apart. We've encouraged new leaders by seeing a 500% increase in inquiries for candidacy. We're developing education in conjunction with the seminary and the Stevenson School of the Episcopal Church for both our rostered and our lay leaders. We've completely revamped the call process and cut the time of vacancies for pastors in half. And when synods cannot fill their pulpits in many places, we can provide multiple candidates for our congregations. Many of you know this because half of all our congregations have transitioned to new leaders in the last five and a half years. We have encouraged cooperation, new parishes were formed, increased sharing of resources, and we walked with you in creating shared youth ministries. Most significantly, we've engaged in new mission. We have 23 congregations in the R3 program. We've worked with other congregations on renewal covenants. We've established new worshiping communities in coffee shops, beauty salons, using wrestling and martial arts, and a group that meets in the VFW. We supported after school programs and preschool programs, all to meet the hungers that we see in our neighborhoods. And I've learned a great deal. It is about the congregations. When we talk about the church, there is the universal church, and then there is the local expression of the congregation, the church wide and the synod can only exist if we work to strengthen our local congregations. And that's what we've been doing each and every day. I believe God still has a mission for us to participate in. And there are congregations that are growing in our synod. There are congregations finding new ways to reach out to their neighbors. And we can do that better altogether. But the work is far done. We've experimented in lots of ways. At the Conference of Bishops, I've sat in conversations about the shape and the structure of the church. We had 65 synods 30 years ago, and we still have 65 synods. There is work to be done to reshape things, to equip leaders, to encourage new ways to cooperate. And I've learned that we're going to need to have some surgically precise tools, that a bulldozer is an effective tool, but not for all jobs. So we have to work carefully to change things. And it's essential that we recall who we are and what it is we need to preserve. Our foundation in our confessional documents and our Lutheran understanding, particularly of God's unmerited grace. There are complex skills to balance in this office in these times of change. 
Vincent van Gogh was a brilliant impressionistic artist. artist. He created great works of art, including Starry Night and Sunflowers, and you can see them in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. But if you explore the whole museum, you'll see that he was classically trained. Intricate drawings he made of the human form in the classical style. You can only begin to push the boundaries when you understand where they are and why they're there. You have given me six years of training so that we can begin to develop the church that needs to become what it needs to become in this century. God is moving in the world. We need to learn from our brothers and sisters in the global church. We need to follow a course of renewal that we've begun. Richard Rohr, our contemporary Jesuit priest and spiritual guide, uses the metaphor for change. Three boxes, order, disorder, and reorder. Some people want to keep us locked in that order box, but we move through that process. You can't skip disorder. You have to go through it to come to reorder. I'm excited to continue the work that we've begun, and I'm excited that we're going to continue to work together for the next years, and I look forward to continuing that work, following the mission that we have been called to by God. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dunlop. Our next speaker, the Reverend Timothy A. Menzer. In March, I moved my parents to a skilled care center. On one of the days, I checked in early in the morning on them. I was dressed up, looking very professional. That evening, I went back and was dressed the way I prefer to be dressed, which was a ball cap, t-shirt, shorts, and sneakers. And as I was leaving, one of the residents said, your brother was here this morning. <laughs> and then said, he dresses a lot better than you do. <laughs> and boy, do we get caught up on how things look. And when we think about the future of the church and the future of the synod, we become immediately focused on how it's going to look. But I think before we can even talk strategy, before we can devise clear plans, we need to carefully identify what we believe. And once we have identified what we believe, then what we do and how the ministry looks can take shape. I believe that the word of God changes lives, that something happens when the word of God is proclaimed. I'm reminded about that every Monday at three o'clock when a man comes to visit me who is in a recovery program. I'm his spiritual mentor in that recovery program. And it was his choosing to stop at the depth of his despair at a Lutheran church in Reading, where they proclaimed the word of God to him that started the process of his recovery. The word of God changes lives. I believe that God is revealed in word in sacrament. The most important thing the church does is worship, where God is revealed in word and sacrament. A couple weeks ago, we had the joy in my congregation of the choirs from St. James Episcopal joining our choirs with a small orchestra to sing a mass together for worship. And what an extraordinary moment it was when we transcended even those denominational boundaries. And we, at that moment, experienced the presence of God in worship. I believe that the word of God speaks a word of justice that is necessary to heal our community. That's personal for me and my wife because of our African-American son. We have to have two conversations with our son. One is the sex talk. The other is what do you do when a police officer pulls you over? Justice is that every person has integrity, no matter what gender, no matter the age, no matter what economic level, no matter how one self-identifies, and that integrity should never be violated by language and actions. 
It's also Please. my belief that the church working together is the greatest expression of the church. When I served in Warren, Ohio, Michael and Susan were members of my congregation. I was their pastor. I visited them through their dementia and I presided at their funerals. Their daughter, Donna, became deaconess in my congregation. When I took a sabbatical, she decided, Donna decided, at that point, discerning a call to ordain ministry. She was ordained as a pastor. She is now my parents' pastor and ministering to them in their dementia and need. The church is at its best when it works together. And I believe that it's important to understand that the mission of the church happens most significantly in the congregational context, not at meta-programmatic levels, but in the congregational context. And when I was sitting with a folks from a congregation in the Hershey area for dinner last night, and they mentioned they took a house of theirs and they allow people who have loved ones who are at Hershey Medical Center to stay in that house. I thought they understand their context and their ministry, and I'm thankful for them. I serve a congregation whose building has been there since 1760. But what is more important than the fact that the building is still standing is that the word of God continues beyond even the 300 years of that congregation. Thank you, Pastor Menzer. The next speaker is the Reverend Brian A. McClinton. Good afternoon. I come before you this afternoon as, I would say, as a moment of the Holy Spirit. When I was in high school and during a time of prayer, that was a moment in the prayer that came to me and I thought that God was calling me to be a pastor. And I went forward trusting that God will assist me in the call. And so I am here today. I was not someone who was uplifted early on. This moment in time became evident this weekend. And so I come before you today as someone who firmly believes that the power of the Holy Spirit is a part of this event, this moment, and this election. One of my favorite songs in my youth was titled, We Are Christians. They Know We Are Christians By Our Love. How many of you know that song? You grew up to it. It was one of my favorites. And I sang it along with others who were growing up in the New Jersey Senate. All of us from different backgrounds, rich, poor, black, white, Hispanic, also gay and straight, arm in arm singing together. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand and together spread the news that God is in our land. Many of us felt the call, the love of God to spread his message through our moments of time in youth group and to bridge the gap of diversity within our country in regards to our own faith as Lutherans. We were saying to ourselves that no more will we have just churches of particular racial groups, but all of us together in love. Well, that was the 1980s. And today, we are living in 2019. Where are we now? I began parish ministry in 1993 
And at that time, there was a lot of promise. The inception of the merger that four years prior came to be and formed the ELCA created a vision for a more diverse church and more people of color working in predominantly white places with some struggles, but having support, but all walking hand in hand to the gospel. And that through the years, as some things changed, and I'm sure we can think of several reasons on why those things have changed over the years. But as our society became less in empathetic, we have to question, did the church do, do as well? As society got more divisive, we as a church split due to our disagreements. So now, as the ELCA has been declared the whitest denomination of Christian faith in the U.S., I think it's time for us to reevaluate what makes us Christian. What is the foundation that makes us who we are? If we say it is our ethnic heritage that makes us the lower Susquehanna Senate, if it is because of the particular ideas on which we stand on, which is good in and of itself, but collectively, we must ask ourselves, has it separated us? Has it moved us away from the true foundation, which is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, God's ultimate presence in the love? I still believe that the congregations can still sing that song, We Are Christians. And I still believe that we as Thank a you. synod can still sing this song. And I still Thank believe you, that we as a church can sing this song together. That we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord, and in the unity, everything will be restored. Thank you, Pastor McClinton. Thank you. Our next speaker is the Reverend Dana Block Hansen. Good afternoon, siblings in Christ. I am humbled to be here to speak to you this afternoon. I wanna tell you that I was born and raised here in our synod in Lebanon. It is through the congregation of St. James, my family and our pastors there that I stand here today. But there are additional relationships that I think are so important that you need to know about. Our synod has amazing youth ministry programs, one of which you may not even be aware of. Early my freshman year, I received the opportunity to attend leadership training camp. That camp was begun almost 30 years ago by two people in our synod who saw the need for youth programming, and especially a program that would help identify young leaders within congregations and train and nurture them. Now this program is not financially sustained by our synod. These two lovely people, Gordon and Sandy Lamb, gave money for that to begin. And we continue that program today through um, different donors and from people who have graduated from that program. Going there helped me to see that I had gifts for ministry. It was people outside of my church family and my own family that were pointing out those same things to me when I didn't even feel worthy to be here. And so I give thanks for those loving and caring adults, for sharing Jesus' love with me. And I'm honored to be a co-director of that camp this day. And I invite you to think about and pray about whether or not you have young people in your congregation in which you can go home on Sunday or another Sunday and say to them, they might not have gifts for ministry, 
but tell them that you value them. Tell them that they are loved not only by God, that is an important reminder because we do question that sometimes, but tell them that you personally love them as well because that will go so far in keeping them as a part of our church. And I'm not just speaking about the ELCA and the Lower Susquehanna Synod, but keeping them a part of Christ's church. Tell them that they are loved and valued. And so identify people for leadership training camp. That camp has produced at least 16 pastors, countless young adult ministers, youth leaders, deacons. It's a wonderful thing, so thank you. Thank you, Pastor Block Hansen. Our next speaker, the Reverend Stephen R. Herr. Bishop Dunlop, Vice President Bringman, Secretary McKee, and voting members of the Assembly, I give thanks to God and am deeply humbled by the opportunity to address you this afternoon. Grace and peace to you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in clay jars so that we may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Paul's words to the church in Corinth focus our attention on the activity and the work of God we are part of God's church, called into being through the power of the Holy Spirit, and led ultimately under the direction of Jesus Christ our Lord. And God entrusts to us this important and sacred task of proclaiming Jesus Christ and not the church itself. For no other entity, no other organization, no other group of people in all of God's creation are entrusted with the holy task of proclaiming Christ crucified and raised from the dead. Only the church, with Christ at his cornerstone and head, is called together by the power of the Spirit through faith to proclaim the gospel. It is at that local expression of this church where that pro proclamation is most profoundly experienced when we gather for holy worship, when we hear God's word, share in the Lord's Supper, baptize, affirm our baptismal promises, care for souls, pray with one another when we love and serve our neighbors. It's then that the gospel message of life, of grace, and of hope refreshes and renews. The role of a synod is to support that local proclamation. And at the heart of that support is caring for people and tending to process. People and process matter. We are called to share the gospel with people, how people are loved, how they're cared for, how they're treated, invited, and welcomed, and included is critical. Ideas, input, involvement that develop at the grassroots level and percolate up, as opposed to decision-making that's hierarchical and scripted, allows for more voices and gifts throughout our synod to be included and involved. As, as decisions are made as a part of our synod assemblies and gatherings, time should be allowed for discussion, debate, critique, and dissent as we seek healthy concord. Let's expand the ways that we involve and include the gifts of all people, all people who are children of God, with the gifts of every age, gender identity, ethnic background, race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and theological convictions. Process matters as we seek to do and care and serve for the common good and to proclaim the gospel. As we move forward into a changing religious climate, we need a synodical structure that is efficient, nimble, adaptable, accountable, highly transparent, and has healthy checks and balances. The Lutheran Confessions and I 
and our heritage identify an important responsibility in the office of the bishop to provide care for congregations, pastors, deacons, and deaconesses. We are all clay jars. We are all fragile, needing support, care, and encouragement in order that we might be revived and strengthened to proclaim, to teach, and minister, and serve. If called to serve as your bishop, caring for those who are called to care for others and for their families would be one of the priorities that I would claim as we journey this road together of proclamation and service. Our synod processes should have a strong, organic, grassroots nature to them, for we value widespread participation that pays attention to even those marginalized voices. May we embrace the opportunity to move forward into the future with bold and daring confidence in God's grace and presence. May we join together to love and care for one another so that we might be encouraged by one another's faith, as Paul tells us to do. And may we take hope and joy in knowing that God has plans for the Lutherans of the Lower Susquehanna Synod. Thank you, Pastor Amen. Herb. Our final speaker is the Reverend Joel Folkemore. First off, this is quite the humbling experience to be able to stand here and just to see you all, and I give thanks for the opportunity, and I give thanks for the support uh, shown and given, and the opportunity to be here and speak before you today. How many of you know Peter the Barber? A few hands know where I'm going with this. Yes, I figured Pastor Schlegel would. She is my mentor, all things Luther. But Peter the Barber was somebody who asked Martin Luther, how do I pray? And this is a question that I hear from people in the pews and on the streets when I'm walking the neighborhoods and meeting with people in coffee shops or whatever. It might be, how do I pray? Do I have to use the fancy words? Do I have to know the right vocabulary? Is it a minimum of 30 seconds? <laughs> I say, you know, 30 is great. It's when we get to like 10 minutes, we got a problem. But how do I pray? And Luther said, well, here are some few things. You can pray through the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer. And you can go petition by petition, line by line, and stop and pray about that specific line or petition. And one of the things we did at Union as we started our redevelopment process is we really recognized we had to revitalize ourselves spiritually before we were ever going to be the church in the world and the church in our streets of York. We went through this process and we learned different ways to express our faith, to share our faith with others, and we learned different ways to pray. And one of those ways was to work through the petitions of the Lord's Prayer, and the part that we stuck on was on earth as in heaven. One of the things that we rejoice and celebrate at Union, and I celebrate today as I look at all of you, is that there is no other time and place where all of us would be together except that the Holy Spirit has brought us here. That the Holy Spirit has used the gifts that each and every one of us have in order to make us stronger as synod together so that we can be the church in the world, for the world, be part of the world. Not to hide, not to go into fear but to be bold in our faith, in our preaching, in our teaching, to tie ourselves to the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion, to worship, to prayer, to Bible study, to serving, to giving, all of the faith practices that God promises will help us grow closer to God, closer to each other, and closer to our neighbors. At Union, we celebrate because we have people from all walks of life walking in our doors. We meet them on the streets. We participate with them. And one story I want to share was I'm sitting in my office and I'm probably playing solitaire. No, I mean, I'm doing work. And <laughs> we are, this is two summers ago, and I hear the door rattling. And I get up and walk over and take a look. And there are some young men, probably middle school. There's four or five boys that, yeah, don't look like me. And they asked, is the church open? I said, well, there's nothing really going on. I recognize them. I knew them from different activities and events and feeding ministries and other stuff that they were a part of. And, but the administrator was there. I was there. said, sure, come on in. What's up? They were very happy to take some candy off the desk in the church office. 
But then we got to hang out. And we got to talk. You same boys that on Wednesdays and other times I get to play bumper pull with, throw football with, play basketball. These young men that we see that then ask, well, where do you do church? So my administrator and I went over and we took to the sanctuary to the nave and they got to say, oh, that's the thing where you splash people with water. Oh, I was at my grandma's church and that's where you do like the bread thing and juice or wine. What is it? Right? They got to look around the windows of the church and ask, what's that picture about? What's going on here? They got to power up the organ and play it. All because they knew that there was a safe place for them to be. And there were things in that place that were building connections and building relationships. But that never would have happened if we didn't ground ourselves in faith. And we didn't leave our building, walk into the streets, open ourselves up and meet the people where they are. And as a synod, that is our call as well. Through the bishop's office or whatever it may be, as we work together and journey together as synod, we have the opportunity to support each other, to provide resources, because believe it or not, it's not all one size fits all but that we celebrate the true gift and beauty of diversity in this world, surrounding us everywhere we are, as we understand that as on earth as it is in heaven, that when we get to heaven, there's going to be a whole lot of people there. Thank you, Pastor Folkemore. And now, would all seven of the nominees please stand and receive our appreciation for their willingness to engage this call process with us. I now invite us into a 10-minute opportunity to have conversation, prayer, and reflection with one another and internally as we continue this discernment process. So we will reconvene in 10 minutes, and I will then, at that point, now concede the chair to Bishop Dunlop.